of the second chapter of Second Thessalonians, verses 1 to 8. This is regarding what many people call the apostasy or the falling away of the church. But I contend there is no apostasy or no falling away. Before we start into this study, I'd like to quote Proverbs chapter 25, verse 2, which says, It is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings is to search out a matter. So it's the glory of God to conceal a thing, but it's our honor to search out a matter. So what we're going to do is search out this matter to see exactly what the word of God says with regard to this uh, prophecy, the study of this prophecy in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Furthermore, in Amos 3, 7, we're told, Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he reveals his secrets unto his servants, the prophets. So God will do nothing, but he will reveal his secrets unto his servants, the prophets. And it's because we are in the end times now that these secrets are being revealed. Um, At the end of the book of Daniel, which has parallel prophecies with the book of Revelation, Daniel asked Gabriel, the angel, the man Gabriel, when will all these prophecies come to pass? And Gabriel more or less told Daniel to mind his own business. And he said the prophecies are sealed up until the time of the end. And in the end times, knowledge will be increased. So this is what's happening now. It's not just technological and scientific knowledge that's being increased, but also knowledge of the scriptures, mysteries and secrets that have been hidden in the book of Revelation and Daniel and elsewhere are being revealed now. Uh, This is the apocalypse, the revealing, because we are in the end times now. So uh, God will do nothing, but he will reveal it unto his prophets first. With that in mind, we start in verse 1 of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, which says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. So it says here, we beseech you. We beseech in the Greek is to beg earnestly, to beg urgently or anxiously to implore to request earnestly so what is paul requesting earnestly or begging or imploring of the believers of thessalonians and he says we beseech you brethren by the coming of our lord jesus christ and by our gathering together unto him that sets the context for this teaching the coming of our lord jesus christ the parousia and our gathering together unto him paul doesn't call it the rapture of the church here Uh, Many, many people, especially in the United States of America, refer to the gathering together as the rapture of the church. And by the way, the word rapture is used in the Bible in the Latin uh, translation of the Vulgate. It's the word uh, rapturo, from which we get the word rapture. It's harpazo in Greek, which means to be caught away. But Paul calls it the gathering together of the saints. So the context here is the coming of the Lord and our gathering together unto him. And he says that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us as that the day of Christ is at hand. So he says that he doesn't want them to be shaken in mind or to be troubled that the day of Christ is at hand. What is the day of Christ? The day of Christ is another name for a period that is coming up which is described described in great detail in the book of Revelation. It's also called the day of judgment, the day of the Lord, the Lord's day, the day of wrath, the day of his cruel anger, um, the day of his burning anger, that great and terrible day of the Lord, the cruel day with wrath and fierce anger, the day of Jacob's trouble, and Jesus referred to it as the great tribulation. So that's what he's talking about. And he says from here that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by a spirit nor by word, nor by a letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. At hand in the Greek there is at present. So what he's saying is, is don't be shaken. Again, uh, shaken here in mind and troubled are very, very extreme Greek words. In other words, these people were shaken in mind and troubled. They were terrified out of their wits, is what it's trying to tell us, because they believed that the day of Christ was at hand. They believed that they were going to go through the tribulation period, the great tribulation, the day of wrath, the day of the Lord. The reason they were uh, terrified and believing this was because somebody had come along. He says, don't be shaken by a, a spirit, nor by a word, nor a letter, as from us, that the day of Christ is at hand. 
Um, many scholars believe that the NASB has the best translation of this verse, where it says that you may not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by a spirit or by a message or a letter as if from us to the effect that the day of the Lord is come. So, these people here were in error. They were in error in their doctrine. And error results in doubt. Doubt results in fear. And fear leads to no peace in your life. So what is the answer to error when it comes to the word of God? The answer to error is right doctrine. How to believe rightly. And when you've got the right doctrine, then you get rid of your error, you get rid of your doubt, and the fear goes. And then you can move on. Verse 3. It says, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. So the man of sin, the son of perdition, is the guy we call the Antichrist. My new book is called Return of the Antichrist and the New World Order. But I point out in my book that he's never called the Antichrist in the book of Revelation. Uh, John, the revelator, always refers to him as the beast from the abyss. In fact, his full title is the beast who ascends out of the abyss having seven heads and ten horns. And the seven heads and ten horns are metaphors, and I explain exactly what they are and what they mean in my book. But he says, let no man deceive you by any means. And when it comes to this falling away and apostasy, there's a lot of deception going on, and a lot of the the deception that is in the church today is being perpetrated by men. But he says, let no man deceive you by any means. He says, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. Then the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. So the whole point is, is that the Antichrist, the beast from the abyss, cannot happen. And the day of the Lord cannot happen until the, there first comes a falling away. A falling away, then the man of sin is revealed. Now, the Greek for falling away is apostasia. Two words, apo and stasia together. And this word apostasia has been transliterated over the years into the English as apostasy. And of, of course, apostasy, if you look up a dictionary, will speak of falling away from the faith, a falling away from the truth, a turning away from uh, biblical truths or matters of faith. But that's not what apostasia meant in the original ancient Greek language. First of all, it's made up of two words, apo and stasia. And in E.W. Bullinger's Companion Bible, which is absolutely a fantastic uh, Bible, E.W. Bullinger lived about 100 years ago. In my opinion, he was the greatest biblical scholar of all time. He's forgotten more about uh, scripture and biblical matters than most of us will ever know. But he has an appendix in there uh, regarding Apo. And this is uh, Appendix 104 of the Companion Bible. And he says, Apo governs only one case, the genitive, and denotes motion from the surface of an object, as a line drawn from the circumference of an object. Hence it is used of motion away from a place. Apo may consequently be used of deliverance or passing away from a state or condition. In Greek, he goes on, apo can be represented as a line drawn starting from the circumference of a circle on going away in an outward direction. Greek is a very mathematical language. It has numerics associated with each letter. And apo, he's saying here, can be depicted as a line drawn from the outside of a circle. You've got a circle, you take a line, and it goes from the outside of the circle in an outward motion. That is the word apo. The word stasia just means a standing away from, or to draw out, or to separate. And the best translation of this word in ancient times, many ancient scholars who are familiar with ancient Greek uh, will agree, is that it means a re-departure. And by the way, when it talks about a falling away here, that's a wrong um, rendering as well, because it's hey apostasia. And the uh, definite article V is put before this word. So it would be the falling away, but a much better rendering is the departure. And the same verb for falling away is used 15 times in the whole of the New Testament, and 12 out of the 15 times 
It's always used as to depart or departing from. That is what the word means. And also, and a lot of people don't know this, the first seven books that were translated from Greek into English all translated this sentence as there must come the departure first. These this was in the Wycliffe Bible, for instance, that was translated in 1384, the Tyndale Bible, 1526, the Coverdale Bible, 1535, the Cranmer Bible, 1539, the Breaches Bible, 1576, the Beza Bible in 1583, and the Geneva Bible in 1608. They all translated this word apostasia as the departure. So there must come the departure first, then the man of sin shall be revealed, the son of perdition. Jerome's Latin translation of 400 AD, known as the Vulgate, also translated this word as the departure. Remember, what is the context of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2? It is the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together unto him. What many people call the rapture. That's the context. There is no falling away. In fact, the Greeks have a different word for fall. Ipto is the Greek for I fall. And this is not the word that is used here. So falling away is a mistranslation. It's wrong, and it has caused all sorts of people to uh, wrongly interpret this whole passage of Scripture. For many, many authors on end time, many good Christian men always say that in the end times, that People are going to turn away from God. They're going to turn away from the Word of God. They're going to turn away from church and fall away. And then they look around at what's happening in the world today with all the secular people, non-Christians. They look at all the hedonistic activity of people and the, the spiral of depravity into which the world is going. And then they say, oh, this is a falling away. But we are not part of the falling away. And I didn't write the book, ladies and gentlemen. But one thing you know, is that the Bible, the Word of God, cannot contradict itself. Right? And in verse 5, Paul says, Remember ye not that when I was with you, I told you these things. He's reminding them. He says, Remember when I was with you, I told you these things. Well, what did he tell them in First Thessalonians? He never mentioned anything in First Thessalonians about Christians falling away or about a rebellion or an apostasy. But what he did tell them in First uh, Thessalonians repeatedly was that Jesus Christ would come back and gather together the saints. Remember, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with the roar, with the shout, with the trumpet of God, the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And he said, wherefore comfort one another with these words. Comfort one another with these words. It's no comfort for some Christian, sincere Christian, to come along to me and say, you've got to go through the tribulation, uh, you've got to, to be tortured and thrown in jail, and if you don't take the mark of the beast, you're going to be put to death, and your wife will be ravished before your eyes, your children will be dashed to pieces if you don't bow down and take the mark of, uh, uh, of the uh, beast. This is not a comfort to me, sir, so please don't tell me that. There are going to be Christians in, in the uh, coming apocalypse, and I deal with that in another teaching uh, called The Coming Slaughter of Christians, which is another chapter in my book. That's a different YouTube, and that's a different topic. But that's not referring to us. Let's go back to uh, chapter 14 of the book of John and see what Jesus said about this very, very famous passage of Scripture. He said, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Jesus said here, I go to prepare a place for you. In fact, he said it twice, I go to prepare a place for you. Why is he preparing a place for us if, we're not, if we are to remain here on earth and if we are not going to the place which he has prepared for us? We all know Jesus ascended into heaven. He's seated at the right hand of his Father in his house of many mansions in the temple of God, Mount Zion, the city of the living God. That's where he is right now. And for the past almost 2,000 years, he's been preparing a place for us. 
So he's up there with his sleeves rolled up. He's mixing cement. He's cutting timber. He's preparing a place for us. And but this is what he says starting off in verse 1. He says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Let not your heart be troubled is similar to comfort one another with these words, which Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 4, and then in 2 Thessalonians 2, don't let your mind and your heart be troubled or be shaken in mind and spirit, as, uh, uh, as to that the day of Christ has started already, that the great tribulation has started, and you are going to go through it. He said, don't do that. And this is why he tells him in verses 5, remember ye not when I was with you, I told you these things. So we are not going to go through the scripture. Let not your heart be troubled, equals comfort one another with these words, equals be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled. And of course, this fits in with the rest of Scripture. Remember I said, Scripture cannot contradict itself. This fits right in with Romans chapter 5, verse 8, which says, Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? We're going to be saved from God's wrath through him. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. And again, in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, for God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. We are not appointed to suffer wrath. We are saved from the wrath to come. We are to wait for his son from heaven, who has rescued us from the coming wrath. Let not your hearts be troubled. You know, comfort one another with these words. Don't let some spirit or some man deceive you that we have to go through the tribulation. It's a lie. It's not the truth. And even if some sincere Christian pastor told you so, this does not adhere to the truth of the word of God. I did not write the Bible, ladies and gentlemen. But what I am presenting to you here is a true and honest rendering. And, you know, God is not going to let something happen until he reveals it first to his prophets. And this is what is, uh, I am sharing with you here tonight. So, as I said already, the Bible cannot um, contradict itself. There is no falling away. In fact, the Bible teaches us quite the opposite. Let us uh, shoot back here for a moment to um, Acts chapter 2. And this was the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was given and it descended like uh, tongues of fire on the apostles and they spoke in tongues. And Peter, who was extremely fearful prior to this and denied Jesus Christ, then gets up after being filled with the Spirit of God and speaking in tongues and, and gave a fantastic uh, um, sermon to all the thousands of people in Jerusalem and the chief priests and the unbelievers and all the people that crucified Jesus. And he hit them right between the eyes with a fantastic presentation. But he said them, um, uh, in verse 16 of Acts chapter 2, he said, But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Okay? So, Quite the opposite to a falling away from the truth and a turning away from God and people abandoning their faith. This is quite the opposite here, according to uh, Peter. He quotes Joel and he said in the last days that God was going to pour out his spirit on all flesh. Young men would prophesy, young women would dream dreams, or old men would see visions. And that's exactly what's happening in these, the last days. Quite the opposite to a falling away. For there's a huge outreach of the word of God all around the world and people are coming to God and, and accepting Jesus as our Lord and Savior in their thousands by the day. This is happening mostly in third world countries like uh, Brazil, Argentina, Colombia, Guatemala, other countries in South America, Africa. I know one of preacher who used to get up to a million people at his uh, meetings. Huge outreach of the word of, of our, in, in Africa. India is the same. China, apparently when Mao Zedong took over in China, there was about 1 million evangelical Christians. Today they, they reckon there's 80 million evangelical Christians in China, and they are seeing signs and miracles and wonders with those Christians over there because they are so poor 
and they have nothing, but they walk out on their faith. And as a result of them walking out on their faith, signs, miracles, and wonders are following them. And even in America, the United States of America, which is a total paradox, because it's one of the richest, it is the richest country in the world. It's got, you know, Hollywood, it's got all this horrible stuff coming out of Hollywood, it's armaments going all over the world, pornography, drugs, and yet about half the population of the United States are conservative, and many, many of them are evangelical Christians who love God and love Jesus and love the Word of God. There's huge outreach of the Word of God in, in the United States also. So, the point is, is that now the Word of God doesn't contradict itself. It can't say that God is going to pour out the Spirit in one place and then tell you in another place that there's going to be a falling away from the church. Quite the opposite, because that day cannot come. The day of the Lord, the day of wrath, the day of tribulation, the great tribulation, the day of Jacob's trouble, which ties in that period, by the way, to the Jewish people, it cannot come until we first have the, the departure. Then the man of sin is revealed. Then the son of perdition is going to come out, who opposes, verse 4, opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, all that is worshipped, so that he is God, sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And it says in verse 6, now you know what is withholding him. It's the word of God. And by the way, with regard to the, the, the spirit of God being poured out in your young mental prophecy and your, your old mental dream dreams, etc., I have a pastor friend uh, who a few months ago was riding his Harley Davidson uh, on the beach on the Pacific Ocean in California because he's into Harley Davidson's. And he stopped there and he was musing for a while and God spoke to him in a booming voice and he said, because you have been so faithful to me and a good and faithful servant, I'm going to grant you one wish. So the man thought for a moment and he said, build me a bridge to Hawaii so he could ride his motorbike across it. And God replied to him, well, that would be a huge undertaking to build a bid bridge all the way to Hawaii. It would use up all the concrete in the world. It, it would use up all the steel. I could do it, but I can't really justify it. Is there anything else that I can do for humankind uh, instead of building this bridge? So my friend thought for a moment, and he says, he said, well, I wish all men could understand women. He says, I want to know what she's thinking when I get the silent treatments, uh, why she cries. I want to know what she means when she says nothing's wrong, and how can, I, how can men make women truly happy? And God replied to him, you want two lanes or four lanes on that bridge? <laughs> but that's just a little joke there. <laughs> well, Patrick. Well, I'm glad I don't get paid for my jokes. Let's go back to Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 6. And now you know what withhold it that he might be revealed in his time, speaking about the son of perdition, the man of sin, who is the Antichrist, who is the beast, who ascends out of the abyss, having seven heads and ten horns, and so called 33 times by John, the revelator. He's referred to as the beast in the book of Revelation, no less than 33 times. Four, verse seven, the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now let it will let until he be taken out of the way, or in the Greek that should read, he be taken out of the midst. So the word in verse 6, withhold it, and now you know with what withhold it. And in verse 7, only he who let it will let until he be taken out of the way. That is the Greek word kachiko, the same word for those two there, which means to hold fast, to hold back, to restrain, to detain, to hinder, to stop from going forward. So, what it should really read in verse 6 is, now you know what restrains him, that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who restrains, or hold fast, or detains, will do so until he be taken out of the way. So what it's saying is, is that we know now what's holding him back. We know what's restraining the Antichrist, in his place where he is right now. What's restraining him, what's re detaining him, what's holding him, him back. It is the fact that the Christians are still on this earth, that the Holy Spirit indwelling in the Church of God, the ecclesia, the called out of God, the body of Christ, is still present on this earth 
at this time. And that is what is detaining and restraining the Antichrist for coming forward, because he cannot come forward until first we have the departure. That's exactly what the Word of God is saying here. And when it says, now you know uh, what holds him back until he be taken out of the way, what that is referring to is referring to the Holy Spirit being taken out of the midst, out of the midst of this crooked and perverse nation. And when he's taken out of the way, the body of Christ is departed, then the Antichrist is revealed. And remember that word, uh, apo, is also used of motion away from the circumference of a circle. Well, if you're in the departure lounge of an airport, you get onto a plane, and then you take off and you go up into the air, that is that word apo. That is the departure. And we're, at the moment, ladies and gentlemen, literally in the departure lounge, waiting to depart when the Lord comes back with a roar, with a shout, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ will, re- will be raised for us. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet him in the air. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Let not your heart be troubled, you know. You believe in God, trust also in me. You know, don't let your mind be shaken or be troubled, neither by a spirit nor by a man who will deceive you with deceiving words. And it hates, it, it, it's terrible for me to have to say this, but many, many of the people that are deceiving the church of God and that are allowing these spirits to work through them today are evangelical, Bible-believing Christians. Wow. And if you're one of those, then let me say that Paul says you're wrong. How many times do, do we have to be told we're saved from the wrath to come? We're to wait for Jesus who has rescued us from the coming wrath. We are not appointed to wrath. We are going to heaven. He's preparing a place for us. And to, to preach or teach anything else is allowing an evil spirit to walk through you in order to put doubt and fear and worry and terrify people today. And just as there was men doing that in the original first century church to these believers in Thessalonica, there are many, many Christian people today terrifying and putting fear and anxiety and worry into Christians today by this wrong teaching, by this error. Because that day cannot come until the departure comes first. That is what the word of God. Remember the whole context of this teaching in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, chapter 2, excuse me, verses 1 to 8. And the context is the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together unto him. The gathering together of 2 Thessalonians 2 is equal to being caught up together to meet him in the clouds of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, which is equal to the the departure of 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 2, verse 3, that that day cannot come until we first have the departure, which is also equal to he being taken out of the midst when the body of Christ is removed. All these four things are what we call the rapture or the gathering together of the church. I did not write the book, ladies and gentlemen, but that is what the Word of God says. And I might just also say that I covered this in great detail. What I've just shared with you now is a synopsis of one of the uh, chapters in my book, Return of the Antichrist and the New World Order. Uh, I have other chapters in here dealing with this, including one, as I mentioned earlier, called The Coming Slaughter of Christians, where I will be dealing with the parable of the ten virgins, the five wise virgins who had oil in their lamp, and the five unwise virgins who had no oil in their lamp. That is coming soon. And I'd just like to say that three people wrote to me and told me that they cried after reading this book because it cleared up all the fear, all the confusion, and all the worries that they had and that they were experiencing because other Christians were telling them that we must go through this horrible, horrible time of torment and of trial which is to come in the coming apocalypse. And when you get the right doctrine, then the error goes, the doubt goes, the fear goes, and you can comfort one another with these words. So with that in mind, I'd like to thank you for looking in here today. I want to thank you and bless you, and I hope you can all bless one another uh, in these days and weeks and months ahead as we wait for the soon coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
and as we wait uh, for he who shall rescue us from the world to come, my website is www.neph.ie.